you seek him with all your heart and do his perfect will. He will give you such peace and joy and you with his spirit will fill. You with his spirit will fill. You with his spirit will fill. If you seek Him with all your heart and do His perfect will, He will give you such peace and joy and you with His Spirit will fill. You with His Spirit will fill. You with His Spirit will fill. Stretch out his hands to you and your soul from sin he will save. Your soul from sin he will save. Your soul from sin he will save. If you believe with all your heart and step on the waters in faith. Will stretch out his hands to you, and your soul from sin he will save. Your soul from sin he will save. Your soul from sin he will save. I am the real vine and my father is the gardener. He breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And he prunes every branch that does bear fruit. So that it will be clean and bear more fruit. You have been made clean already by the teaching I have given you. Remain united to me. And I will remain united to you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It can do so only if it remains in the vine. In the same way, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. And you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit. For you can do nothing without me. Those who do not remain in me are thrown out like a branch and dry up. Such branches are gathered up thrown into the fire, where they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish, and you shall have it. My Father's glory is shown by your bearing much fruit, and in this way you become my disciples. I love you, just as the Father loves me. Remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love one another, just as I love you. 
The greatest love you can have for your friends is to give your life for them. And you are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, because I have told you everything I heard from my father. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit. The kind of fruit that endures. And so, the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. This, then, is what I command you. Love one another. If the world hates you, just remember that it has hated me first. If you belong to the world, then the world would love you as its own. But I chose you from this world, and you do not belong to it. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. Slaves are not greater than their master. If people persecuted me, they will persecute you too. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours too. But they will do all this to you because you are mine. For they do not know the one who sent me. They would not have been guilty of sin if I had not come and spoken to them. As it is, they no longer have any excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me, hates my father also. They would not have been guilty of sin if I had not done among them the things that no one else ever did. As it is, they have seen what I did. And they hate both me and my father. This, however, was bound to happen, so that what is written in their law may come true. They hated me for no reason at all. The Helper will come, the Spirit who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father, and he will speak about me, and you too will speak about me. Because you have been with me from the very beginning. Hi friends, welcome back. And we are coming to the conclusion of 1 John. And we'll see how we go through this video. If we need another one after this. But perhaps this will be the last one. No promises, no guarantees. But I appreciate you, you tuning in. It's been a blessed study through 1 John. And you know we looked at the original intent of this letter. It was to speak against John was speaking against an error or errors creeping into the church from the Gnostics specifically who were preaching uh, another Jesus or a false Jesus and that it gave people a permission to indulge in fleshly lustful sins against God's law against God's word disobeying God and that your spirit was somehow clean and that Jesus really didn't come in the flesh, and uh, really it wasn't him on the cross. In fact, some even think that Judas was the replacement. That may even be um, a Muslim teaching, uh, but I'm not, not entirely sure on that one. But anyway, the Gnostics were in full swing teaching the heretical doctrine. So Paul is, uh, John is definitely going against that false teaching among others, going against uh, a licentious lifestyle and uh, teaching primarily holiness and love for your brother and also how to abide in Jesus and how we can have a confidence when we are walking close with Jesus or close with the Lord. So we left off talking about a complicated subject, uh, uh, prayer, and there is sin and a sin unto death and the conclusion was that the sin unto death was um, a result or or coincided with uh, blaspheming the holy spirit which is a hardening of the heart and it's almost as if you are taking part in little sin seems to be the predominant mode you're taking part in little sin sipping from sin and I would say it's a hardening of your heart and growing indifferent 
to the voice of the Spirit in God's Word. And so it will take severe uh, things to try and break a sinner, a habitual sinner, out of that mode, like an ice, like layers of ice being formed on your heart. And layer upon layer, it gets harder and harder. So you either have to apply a, an ice pick to get rid of those layers, which is a very a mechanical means and a very um, forceful means, or you have to apply intense heat somehow on the inside, which uh, you know would mean that the Holy Spirit, I would liken that to the Holy Spirit taking extreme measures in a person's life um, to try to get them to turn around from sin so that it truly wouldn't be a sin unto death. And it might even be um, turning a Christian who has backslidden or gone into sin. It could go, be as far as turning them over to Satan um, to buffet his body to come against him so that his soul might be saved. And that is a church discipline we saw in the last video that is an extreme measure that has to happen sometimes. Um, people, Christians, get engaged in sin and uh, they need to repent and sometimes they are unwilling to repent. So if they grieve the Holy Spirit, you know, we're to line up as the church with the Holy Spirit and we are to, for that man's or woman's good, put them out of the church so that uh, they can be buffeted by the enemy and then perhaps they will awaken at some point and repent and that their soul can be saved so yeah it's a deep topic and we should pray for I'd say 99% of the time we should pray for people and if you have wisdom from the Holy Spirit as to when a person is beyond prayer that the Lord is bringing judgment then that would be the this case of the uh, sin unto death and we wouldn't pray for that but that shouldn't be the norm that should be the exception and it should only come with wisdom I believe from from the Lord that should not be gone about lightly you may need to fast you may need to uh, hear you know get alone with God fast research his word meditate on his word let the Holy Spirit speak um, regarding that situation so we talked about that in length in the last video. Now we're going to move on to verse 17. So in this verse, it says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. All right, so we talked about a sin unto death. Now there's a sin not unto death. So the, the term all unrighteousness is sin this seems to be thrown in to guard what he had just said. And there is one great and enormous sin, a sin which could not be forgiven. But he says also that there are many other forms and degrees of sin. Sin for which prayer may be made. Everything, he says, which is unrighteous, and that word in the Greek is adikia, ad, adikia, Everything which does not conform to the holy law of God and which is not right in the view of that law is to, do, to be regarded as sin. And we know in 1 John 3, 4 that sin is a willful transgression of God's law. That's one aspect of it. It's also uh, failing to do those things in James 4, 7, failing to do what we know we should do or what we ought to do in not doing it. So there's the active form and the passive form. Okay, so, but we are not to suppose that all sin of that kind is of such a character that it cannot possibly be forgiven. There are many who commit sin who we may hope will be recovered, and for them it is proper to pray. Deeply affected as we may be in view of the fact that there is a sin which can never be pardoned, and much as we may pity one who has been guilty of such a sin, yet we should not hastily conclude in any case that it has been committed and should bear constantly in mind that while there is one such sin, there are multitudes that may be pardoned, and that for them it is our duty unceasingly to pray. So I think that, those are Albert's comments, I think that sums up quite well what, what I just shared as a summary. So we're going to go to verse 18 now. And in this verse, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, 
and that wicked one touches him not. Now we've seen a similar verse in, I believe it was 1 John 3. We'll get to that in a little bit. But this first part of the verse here, um, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And that simply means is not habitually and characteristically a sinner, does not ultimately and finally sin and perish. Um, so I like, you know, we, we did depart from Albert's comments in, in this uh, explanation of this verse in 1 John 3. And we went to um, Charles Finney, who likened this meaning that, you know, the, the, the Christian is when you're born of God, you have the Holy Spirit abiding in you. And for as many as are led by the Spirit of God um, are the sons of God. And so we, for if ye have, uh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So as a born again believer, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. You have God's word uh, in, um, abiding in you. You've, you've. Uh, the Lord has opened your mind, your heart to the Word of God, and you have understanding. His seed is in you. And so, the who, whosoever is born of God doesn't sin. He cannot sin. There's a strong unwillingness because there's a strong influence from the Lord and from His Word. It doesn't mean that He doesn't have a free will anymore. It, do, it means that He doesn't sin anymore. The sin... The habitual sin, um, you are purifying yourself as he is pure. You're on the road, on a walk of holiness. You are living in holiness and being holy as he is holy. All right, so it doesn't mean that you cannot go off the path. It doesn't mean that you can't jump out of his hand. And he said that, you know, my sheep know my voice and no one can take them out of my hand. Well, people, the sheep can jump out of his hand. So, but as a born again believer, and as you stay close to the Lord, there is a strong unwillingness to sin. And that's how it should be. And you have to resist temptation. And we can do it through the help of the Holy Spirit. Remember, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there is no temptation. Uh, temptation that's taken you but such as common to man um, but God is faithful who will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you and I may be able to bear it so we can we can agree with John this is in harmony with John we know that whosoever is born of God doesn't sin that should be the main stay of your lifestyle you uh, have a strong unwillingness to sin um, just like you would have a strong unwillingness to take ten dollars for your Rolex watch you're not going to take it because you know it has an infinitely higher value so is it with the Christian you have the infinite high value of the Holy Spirit abiding in you in his relation your relationship with God you don't want to lose that you value it so much and you have his voice right there so I believe this is the communion that was lost in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. And through the new covenant, through Jesus making the way through his life, shedding his life on the cross, he is in the new covenant reestablishing that abiding presence of the Lord in the believer. So let's go on. Um, though a Christian may fall into sin, right, it still can happen. And in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, that's a form of repentance. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, we can fall into sin. It does happen. And, you know, there is a way out. And that's why we should never cease to pray for a Christian, for a brother that you're near to. Um we're not to feel that he has committed the sin with which has never forgiveness and that he has thrown himself beyond the reach of our prayers. So this passage in 1 John 5.18, in its connection, is a full proof that um, if you are a true Christian, 
well, I, again, Albert seems to be off the mark in my in my minds. In my mind, he's trying to reassure believers in a certain way, and I I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, his opinion, but I believe that there is a strong unwillingness to sin. And then there are some verses here that out of Hebrews that can say that a person um, can backslide. And this is why we always have to be careful. In Hebrews 6, 4 through verse 8, I'm going to go through. So it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs fit for them by whom it is dressed receives blessing from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, near unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. All right, so, you know, if you look at these verses, um, we see that it's impossible. So there is, this is the, the can be the unpardonable sin um, that you can reach a state because you were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift you were once enlightened you were you received the new birth and you are partakers of the Holy Ghost so these are believers in that have the Holy Ghost they responded to the gospel they repented of their sin they trusted in Jesus he forgave them but now they've um, they've gone back. They've tasted of the good word of God and the, of the powers of the world to come. So they received these, these supernatural gift of salvation, initial salvation. And if they should fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify you, it's as though you're putting Jesus on the cross again. And you are not accepting the resurrection that he went through for you and I. And then he's he, in these last two verses, um, it's basically saying, uh, you know, there are good blessings from the Lord when we drink in the rain. Plants bring forth, or it helps herbs to produce, and it the production is for the dresser of the vineyard or the dresser of the garden, and. It receives blessing from God so it's as though there's good fruit and then there is that which bears thorns and briars and that's to be rejected and it's nigh unto cursing so it's near there that means their life could be uh, ended when they bring forth bad fruit you know they're not a good tree anymore they're a bad tree and a bad tree brings forth corrupt fruit so again we're gonna know them by their fruits and this is, uh, you know, this is very similar to what Satan, uh, the revelation Satan had when, when he fell. He had perfect revelation of God and his goodness and could see God face to face. And then yet he rejected God in his truth. And here the newborn believer, the one who's born from above, is in a close relationship even though we don't see God face to face physically uh, we know God spiritually uh, we know God in our inner man he is abiding in us and so if we reject that what kind of influence would it take to get you back you know there's nothing greater than what he's already given us that could win us back if you've rejected that if you if you've rejected the light he's already given you then what other influence in the world could win you back? That's why it's, it's, we have to be cautionary. We have to be on guard. We have to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. And know that we have an adversary who's walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. We can't let sin come in and, and allow that, that, uh, those layers of ice, that sediment, you know, as a, uh, as, I'm thinking of um, it's as though a sediment accumulates on the heart and it hardens it, uh, you know, like minerals 
if something were put in water, flowing water with a high amount of minerals um, that deposit on an object and it just coats it with layer upon layer, this hard crust. That's what sin can do to you and it hardens it hardens your conscience. It hardens your uh, it makes your conscience less sensitive and you just give in and become less sensitive to the influence of God and the Spirit of God and His Word. So what would it take to win you back if you allow that to happen? That's why sin is so deadly. It's a slow arsenic poisoning to the Christian that's going to destroy him in the end. So we have to repent quickly. We have to confess our sins quickly so that it do we doesn't turn into the sin unto death. Okay, so... All right, so there's another verse in Hebrews 10:26 where it says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So when we sin, then we're not walking in the light. Then we don't have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't cleanse us from all sin, as it says in 1 John 1, 7. So that's why we have to repent in 1 John 1, 9, so that, uh, we can res establish that relationship with the Lord, keep it intact, that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Because remember that the Lord will bring condemnation upon a believer if he is in sin as a means of mercy to uh, drive him to repentance. And so if you go out and engage in sin, well, yes, you there remains no more sacrifice for sins. And if we let our hearts get hard enough, through the deceitfulness of sin, it can destroy us without any repentance. And that's what uh, John is trying to warn of here. So, all right, so then there's some the, some verses uh, from 1 John 3 that, if you'll remember, we covered these. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sins hath not seen him, neither known him. So you don't, you know, if you're abiding in him, you're not going to sin. And if you're sinning, then you haven't seen him, neither do you know him. You've lost relationship with him. You know, once you engage in, in habitual sin, once you, you know, I'm not saying you, you, you mess up and you slip off the narrow path um, and you, you give in to weakness, you give in to temptation. You have to get back up and you have to fortify that area of your life taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You have to you have to do what you need to do to resist the devil and he will flee. You have to submit to God. And you know, he goes on and he says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So John just lays it out. A man is righteous because he does righteousness. He does he obeys the Lord. That's what makes a man righteous. It's not an imputed righteousness of Christ that we get his righteousness magically. Yes, we are forgiven in initial salvation because of the blood of Jesus. And we are considered righteous. We are considered um, holy at that point. But it does not give you a license to move forward in sin. You are to walk out your righteousness now. You're not saved by your own works, but you have an obligation to walk in holiness and to purify yourself and to deny yourself and to pick up your cross and follow him. You know, we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Right? So we are to work out our holiness and we're to be perfect even as the Lord, as, a, as our Heavenly Father is perfect, as Jesus said in Matthew 5.48. Alright, so... He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's what Jesus wants to do in your life, to destroy the works of the devil. Not only did he come to, uh, to forgive you of sin, but he came to help you to become an overcomer of sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil, sin in your life. And he wants to do that. You have to let him. You can do it because he's given us his spirit and abides in us. 
whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. All right, this is what we're talking about in 1 John 5.18. You don't commit sin when you are in relationship with the Lord. You are walking under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You are, there's a strong unwillingness to commit sin. It doesn't mean you can't fall into sin. And it says he cannot sin. That's that strong unwillingness because he is born of God. It says his seed remains in him. I believe the seed references the word of God. God's word, his holy word, his influence is upon your mind. And you're meditating upon it. Just as Jesus used the word of God to overcome the, devil, the temptations of the devil in the wilderness in Matthew 4. So are we to meditate and keep his word hiding it in our heart and meditating upon it and that is a strong influence upon your mind upon your actions so there is a strong unwillingness to sin and I believe that's the last one I wanted to go through um, regarding first John 3 uh, yeah 6 through 9 there is another verse we're gonna get into here so let's let's go back to our textual verse here all right, so he keeps himself in this verse. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself. So it is not said that he does it by his own strength, but he will put forth his best efforts to keep himself from sin. And by divine assistance, he will be able to accomplish it. Right, so there is a grace that through divine assistance that we are given and this is 1 John 3, 3. For every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, you, even as he is pure. And the hope is that, you know, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, so when Jesus comes back, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so with this expectation in mind, we are to become like him now. We're to purify ourselves even as he is pure, right? That's the goal. We want to be just like him, and that happens when he returns. But now we're to do our best to be like him now, here and now on earth. It's not just a waiting, waiting around, and he's going to magically turn us into this righteous character. No, he wants us to be walking that out right now, and it'll be perfected when he returns. All right, then we go to Jude 121, where the admonishment is, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto, unto eternal life. So there is a doing on our part. There is a keeping on our part. He's saying, you know, we would pray, Lord, keep me in, in Jesus Christ, right? Or keep me in the love of God. Well, what is the Lord saying? What is, what is Jude saying? He says, keep yourselves keep yourself so there is a doing on our part the Lord just doesn't do everything for us all right and then we'll go back to our textual verse here all right and the wicked one no I have one more verse you know this is interesting um, Jesus said this. Hereafter, I will, you know, before he goes to the cross, telling his disciples in John 14, from this point afterwards, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of the world comes, right? So he's about to be portrayed by Judas. And the prince of the world we know is Satan, and he's coming, and we know that he entered Judas, and he has nothing in him. Right? There is no accusation Satan can bring against Jesus' life. He has no sin in him. Right, But he's only coming because the Father is opening up the ability of him to come and arrest Jesus. Where before Jesus could pass through an angry mob who wants to throw him off a cliff, and they couldn't touch him because the Father was protecting him, and it wasn't his time. But now the Father was allowing it because it was the will of God that Jesus would come came to die for the sin of the world and now was the time but 
Satan couldn't come because of Jesus' sin. Jesus walked holy. There was no deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. Um, when, he was, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself unto him that judges righteously, his father. So it says here that wicked one touches him not. The great enemy of all good is repelled in his assaults, and he is kept from f falling into his snares. The word toucheth in the Greek is hap haptitai. Haptitai is used here in the sense of harm or injure. So the wicked one harms him not or, or injures him not. All right, now we go to verse 19. There's quite a few verses in this to go through. All right, so, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. So, who is the we? We who are Christians. The apostles supposed that true Christians might have so clear evidence of that subject as to leave no doubt on their own minds that they were the children of God. All right, and he's got some verses here in 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So this is a sign. This is a fruit that we are born of God, that we love his brethren, those who uh, call upon the name of Christ and walk in his commandments, keeping his word and have his spirit abiding in him and then second timothy 1 12 for the which cause i also suffer these things paul speaking nevertheless i am not ashamed for i know whom i have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which i have committed unto him against that day so paul is not ashamed you know jesus said if you are ashamed of me and my words when I come in the glory of my Father, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So if any man whosoever is ashamed of him and his words, of him also the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the, in the power of his Father, in the glory of his Father, and with the holy angels. Paul is saying that he is not ashamed, and he knows that. He knows him. How do you know him? If we abide in him. How do we abide in him? If we keep his commandments. Paul was telling Timothy, I have this confidence in me. I have kept the faith. And that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What has he committed unto him? His soul. Right? Our life is in the Lord. He holds the keys of hell and of death. Paul has a strong confidence in the Lord. That's where we need to be, friends. That's where we need to be, abiding in him. And, and we know from John uh, 15 that whoso, who abides in him, I'm going to look that verse up, who abides in him is he that keeps his commandments. Remember, he's the vine. He says, abide in me. Abide in me as I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. Here it is. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, ye shall, you shall abide in my love. Wait a minute. No, you don't have to keep his commandments to abide in his love. Jesus just cleanses you without any work on our part. Oh, no, that's not what Jesus said. Look, friend, he said, if you keep his commandments, you shall abide in his love. Where there's a doing, just as I've been mentioning, there's a doing on our part. And he says, 
even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And this isn't grievous. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. If you want joy, friends, this is the way to do it. Abide in the Lord. This is what Paul was talking about in 2 Timothy 1.12. He was, he was saying that he knows he's not ashamed and he's persuaded that the Lord is faithful and able to keep which, that which I have committed unto him against that day, his soul. I believe that's reference to his soul. All right, so, all right, and in this verse it also says, and we know that we are of God in the whole world. What does the whole world mean? The term world here evidently means not the material world, but the people who dwell on the earth, including all idolaters and all sinners of every grade and kind. All right, so the whole world lies in wickedness or in the wicked one or under the power of the wicked one. That's what the Greek means. It means en tu ponero. That's the Greek. En tu ponero. Under the power of the wicked one. Is the true? It is true that the word ponero may be used here in a neuter gender. In the neuter gender. gender so genderless as our translators have rendered it, meaning in that which is evil or in wickedness. But it may be in the masculine gender, meaning the wicked one. All right, so even though the translators have said uh, lieth in wickedness, it could also mean the masculine gender in, under the wicked one, under the power of the wicked one. That this is meaning, this is the meaning of the apostle seems to be clear because, so he, Albert is saying this is what the true meaning is. It should be a masculine gender, meaning the wicked one. So it should be, um, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the, I would say, the power of the wicked one. Under the power of the wicked one. This is why he believes that. First, the corresponding phrase in verse 20, all right, so verse 20 is N. Ento alethino, ento alethino, three words, in him that is true, is evidently, evidently construed to be construed in the masculine, referring to God the Savior and meaning him that is true and not that we are in truth, right? So it says here, uh, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true instead of him that is true he's saying um no yeah him that is true that's how it's that's how it is translated not in truth yeah so it's he's saying that it's translated in the masculine so this is why he believes that the last verse 19 is the the masculine gender Secondly, it makes better sense to say that the world lies under the, under the control of the wicked one than to say that it lies in wickedness. Right, that does make sense. Third, the, this accords better with the other representations of the Bible and the uses of, usage of the word elsewhere. So, yeah, I guess we're looking at the usage of the words ponero, ponero being in the, um, the masculine gender. So it comports well with how it's used in other verses. We'll look at some of those verses, like First John, uh, no, First John two thirteen. Um, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. There it is. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. So it's in that second uh, um, prepositional phrase, I would say because you have overcome the wicked one. Yeah, 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay, hold on. <laughs> this might be a mistake. Yeah, it was a mistake. It's 1 John 2, 14. Next verse, I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong 
and the word of God abides in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. There it is. Then he's got 1 John 3, 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore, so he was under the power of the wicked one, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So Cain was a wicked man. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So, yeah, in whom the God of this world hath blinded. So the God of this world is the expression here, the wicked one, or the God of this world. Masculine of por Ponero. John 12.31 now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. So the prince of the world. Yep. And then Ephesians 2.2. 2. Where and in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. There it is. The, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So the prince of the power of the air is that the word uh, that is... Um, in harmony with 1 John 5.19, which we're talking about, Ponero, and then Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So th there it is. It's um, Satan-controlled world, the prince of the power of the air. Right? And the rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, principalities. So we are wrestling against those. There are those who are under the power of the wicked one. And so were you when you, before the new birth, before Jesus came and rescued you from a life of sin and death. 1 Corinthians 10.20 but I say that the things with the, which the Gentile, the Gentile sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. So all these passages, it is supposed that Satan has control over the world, especially the pagan world, especially the world of the infidels. In regard to the fact that the pagan world was pervaded by wickedness, he shows you verses in Romans. And these are very telltale verses because it, what it explains is that men, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. If you go back in verse 18, you know, first, we're the just shall live by faith in 17. And then in 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So they're, they're resisting God's truth that he has shown them. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. God is showing them truth, and they're resisting the truth. For the invisible things of him, even though God's invisible, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power in God has, so that they are without excuse. Man has zero excuse, full culpability of their sins, and they reject it. They just downright resist God, and they hate God, They can and they hate his word. They're enemies of God in their minds through their wicked works. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain, in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible god into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things wherefore god has also given them up to uncleanness so god gives them up to their own will through the lusts of their own hearts he gives them up to follow the desires and lusts sinful lusts of their own heart to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, 
talking about the abomination of homosexuality in God's sight. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, they burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, that which is against nature, and receiving in themselves that recompense or the reward of their error which was fitting or meet or just. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them, so they don't want to retain anything about God in their knowledge. They're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. God gives them over to a reprobate mind, a rebellious mind, to do those things which are not convenient. That reprobate mind, I believe, is the mind where it's so hardened and their conscience is so seared, they're totally insensitive, where they become an outright active enemy to God. Being filled with all unrighteousness, they're fornicators, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, they're proud, they're boasters, they're inventors of evil things. Thank you, Hollywood. They're disobedient to parents. They're without understanding. They break covenants. You know, they don't keep their word. They're without natural affection. They don't love their family. They don't honor and esteem uh, those that are close to them. They're implacable. Placible, uh, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, so they know that there's a judgment, they know that God condemns them for these things, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure, they have pleasure in them that do them. So this is the state of this world under the wicked one, under the power of the wicked one. And this is the operation that Satan has control over. Those who love sin and engage in sin and will not submit themselves to God, this is their state. They're under the power, the Panero, of the wicked one. All right, and we'll jump back to our textual verse. So we were here. And the whole world lies under the power of the wicked one. And then he's got another point here. It may be added that this interpretation is adopted by the most eminent critics and commentators. It seems here to refer to the passive and tor torpid, I don't know what that word means, state of a wicked world under the dominion of the prince of evil in acquiescing as acquiescing or proving in his reign, making no resistance, not even struggling to be free. It lies thus as a beast that is subdued, a body that is dead, or anything that is wholly passive, quiet, and inert. There is no energy, no effort to throw off the rain, no resistance, no struggling. The dominion is complete, and body and soul, individuals and nations, are entirely subject to his will. I mean, this is like becoming a slave to your sin, right? Jesus Christ said, whoever commits sin in John 8 is the servant or the slave of sin, which means slave is his, the uh, sin is his master. So when you go down the road of sin, you become a servant, a slave uh, to the power of sin. And, you know, Paul talks about in, in Romans 7 that he goes through his life in Romans 7, 14 to I think 25, how he was under he knew God's law, being a Jew, he was under uh, the power of sin, and he was committing sin in the area of lust, specifically. He had not known sin, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Uh, or he had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So he he says at the end, who's going to who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And he says, then, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Um and then he goes into Romans 8 and says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. So Jesus came to deliver us from the bondage of sin to the slavery to sin and bring us into God's house, right? He who the Son sets free is free indeed. So if you continue in his word, then are you his disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And the servant, the slave, doesn't abide in God's house forever, but uh, he, but the son abides forever. And if you are clean in the son through the, uh, you know, as Paul said, 
I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, and we're, we're being led by the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But if you know, if you walk, for if you walk after the flesh, uh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we are to walk after the Spirit. We are to live after the Spirit. That is our new covenant hope. And then there is no condemnation. The Lord forgives and pardons us. But we're no longer under the power and dominion of the devil. And we can abide in God's house. Thank you, Jesus. So the, the striking expression will not unaptly now describe the condition of the pagan world or the sinners in general. There would seem to be no government under which people are so little resistive or so little restive and against which they have so little disposition to rebel as that of Satan. Right, so they love following Satan because Satan doesn't condemn them for their sin. He encourages sin. He wants to destroy their souls. You know, he, they can't say, as Paul said, I know whom I have believed in and whom I have committed my most valuable possession, my soul, in Jesus Christ. I have this confidence. No, they can't be like that. They're under the devil. And so now um, Satan won't resist them until until they, they sense their need to repent and turn to Christ. That's when... Uh, the devil goes full adversary on them. No more the subtle enemy. He is now the the open, the active, the in-your-face enemy. You are. He opposes all that follow God. All right, so 2 Timothy 2.26 is another verse we want to look at. And let me find it. Where Timothy or Paul says to Timothy, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So he's talking about, you know, in meekness to Timothy, instruct those that oppose themselves, if God perhaps will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So those brothers who have been snared by the devil in sin, and now they're opposing. They're opposing the church, right? Because that's how Satan operates. He comes against the church. He's the accuser of the brethren, the father of the lies. And so Paul is admonishing Timothy um, that in meekness instructing them, that oppose themselves, they're opposing themselves, that they may recover. So they're being, you know, this is God's long suffering that a man might come out of his sin that they might recover themselves because he's been taken in a snare in the trap of the devil and then once you enter in and engage in sin and don't repent um, you're you are the slave of sin again and you're taken taken captive by him at his will so now you have a new master and it's, he's a terrible filthy lying scummy master all right let's go to the next verse first john five twenty. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is true, the true God and eternal life. All right. So when we know that the Son of God has come, we know that by the evidence that John has referred to, uh, we, know that, we know this by the evidence that John has referred to in his epistle. Right, so that's what he talked about in 1 John 1, 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that we also may have fellowship with us, that you may have also fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So this is, uh, again, John is saying, we know that the Son of God is come. Just a reiteration of how he started this letter. 
in that the the goal of this is that these things we write unto you that your joy may be full and then we also saw in the scriptures first john 5 6 through 8 this is he that comes by water and blood even jesus christ not by water only but by water and blood so he was he had a human birth he was born of water and he came in in his life-giving blood the his blood represents his life and he shed that on the cross literally shed his blood and life on the cross for our redemption and it's the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth for there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one uh, the trinity is bearing record evidence that jesus christ he came by water and he came by blood and there are three that bear witness in earth the spirit and i believe this is the renewed spirit our our spirit that is renewed by the blood of christ the renewed man you know knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin in romans 6. so we're walking we're not yielding our members unto unrighteousness unto sin but we are yielding ourselves to god as those that are alive from the dead and our members unto righteousness right so unto god so Romans 6 talks about the new man, the new spirit, the renewed spirit, knowing, uh, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized in his death, right? So we've been raised again by the glory of the Father as he was, and that we should walk in a newness of life. So then we also have the water, more symbolic of the washing of the water of his word. Um, baptism is another symbol of our dying to our old man arising again in newness of life and again the blood uh, his shed blood that cleanses is our atoning sacrifice these three agree in one that um, jesus christ came in the flesh to bear our sin these are all witnesses to um, the life and mission of jesus and how we can know him and be close with him so John is saying that we know that Jesus, the Son of God, is come. Jesus is the Son of God. He came to earth as a man. And he has given us an understanding. So not an understanding considered as a faculty of the mind, for religion gives us, to, gives us no new faculties. But he has so instructed us that we do understand the great truths referred to. So... Uh, it's kind of like Jesus said, uh, if unless a man be born again, he can't even see the kingdom of God. Now, it's not a literal sight in the biggest regard. It's a, a knowledge. And we can't even understand the things of God. You know, kind of like the English expression, do you see what I mean? And we don't understand uh, unless we have the new birth and we've been born of God. So it's not that we have a new mind given to us it's that our understanding is open to us let's look at uh, luke 24 45 then so after the the resurrection jesus walking alongside the two on the road to emmaus um, and he opened he there un, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures so jesus took them through the words of the old testament that all the things that happened to him were going to be fulfilled which were written in the law of moses and in the prophets and in the psalms concerning him and you know there were over 300 prophecies that jesus fulfilled out of the old testament that confirm you know the bible is a supernatural book it's got prophetic prophetic words in there given centuries before of the life of jesus where he you know where he would be born that he would suffer and die that he would be born of a virgin you know just test uh prophecy after prophecy so jesus 
the Lord, the Son of God, has come. He's given us an understanding. We've had our uh, understanding opened. And so all the correct knowledge which we have of God and his government is to be traced directly or indirectly to the great prophet whom God, the Son of God, has sent into the world. Um, Jesus is more than a prophet. He's the Son of God. So John, let's look at John 1, 4. Try to get my software on track. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. There it is, that light. Jesus' revelation is the light. He was the light of men, the revelation to men when he came into the world. No man, no man has seen God at any time, you know, but the, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So Jesus coming from God, has declared him he's the only one that has seen him so he's revealing God to us he's opening our understanding John 8 12 Jesus said I am the light of the world he that follows me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life so there is an understanding Jesus is imparting to those that follow him John 9 5 as long as I am in the world I am the light of the world Right, But he also says in the Sermon on the Mount that we are the light on, of the world. And that a city set on a hill should not, um, cannot be hid, or nor, do we, nor should we put our light under a bushel basket. We should put it in an area where it can shine forth in all the house. So Jesus came to be the light of the world. The church, uh, in his absence, is also a light. So he's opened... We're to, He's opened our understanding. He's opening the understanding of who God is and giving us an understanding to those who are his followers. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 through 1, three, God who at sundry times and in various manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in the, these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds sorry didn't put that up there. And I'm going to move to verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Uh, yeah. And then we've got one verse here in Matthew 11:27. All things are delivered unto me and my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So the Son came. He's given us an understanding. He's revealing to us the Father. He's revealing. He's a light. He's opening up our understanding. He has been with the Father from in heaven and has now come down to earth to reveal it to men, to those who will listen, to those who will hear his words and obey. And he's, he is that light of the world. All right, and we go back now to our verse. So, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, or that is the true God, right? So that is the mission, and we see that in John 17, 3, right? This is eternal, this is life eternal, that we may know the or the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, that we may know him that is true. Right? And you I'm reminded also of John, obviously John fourteen six, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Jesus Christ. So um that we may know him that is true. Jesus is to the truth, he's pointing to the true God. That's what, that's what Jesus' mission was, that they might know his Father, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, the way, the truth, and the life. All right, and we are in him that is true.
All right, that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true. That's an interesting phrase. That is, we are united to him. We belong to him. We are his friends. He said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. We belong to him. We are united to him. We are abiding in him. This idea is often expressed in the scriptures by being in him. It denotes, it denotes a most intimate union as if we were one with him or were a part of him as the branch is in the vine. So we covered that. You know, think of the, the figurative language Jesus used that he said, I am the, the, the vine and you are the branches, right? So we're talking about we are in him, that is true. So he says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Jesus wants you and I to abide in him. We have to stay close to him. In verse 6, if a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So this is what it means not to abide in him. You're cast forth, you are rejected, and you are ultimately burned. That's why it's life essential, life critical to abide in him. So the Greek construction is the same as that applied to the wicked one in 1 John 5.19. So let's look at that verse. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. So instead of wickedness, he's saying is... Uh, under the power of the wicked one. He's saying that's the same as what we were discussing previously. So, en to alathino, or um, up under the power of the wicked one, is how he's interpreting it, or under the wicked one. So, that is, right, that's what we talked about before. Um, let's go back here to the verse 20. So this is the true God. Yeah, so the last part here, he's got, There has been much difference of opinion in regard to this important passage, whether it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, the immediate antecedent, or to more remote antecedent, referring to God as such. The question is of importance and its bearing on the doctrine of the divinity of the Savior, for it refers to him. It furnishes an unequivocal declaration that he is divine. The question is whether John meant that it should be referred to him. Without going into an extended examination of the passage, the following considerations seem to me to make it morally certain that by the phrase, this is the true God, he did refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's got some reasons for it. Wow got a lot of reasons <laughs> okay let's go through some of these here first is the grammatical construction favors it Christ is the immediate antecedent of the pronoun this or hutos this would be regarded as the obvious in certain construction so far as the grammar is concerned unless there were something in the end affirmed which led us to seek some more remote and less obvious antecedent no doubt would have been ever entertained on this point if it had not been for the reluctance to admit that the Lord Jesus is the true God. If the assertion had been that there is the true Messiah, or this is the true Messiah, or that this is the Son of God, or that this is he who was born of the Virgin Mary, there would have been no difficulty in the construction. I admit that his argument is not absolutely decisive. For cases do occur whether a pronoun refers not to the immediate antecedent but to one more remote. But cases of that kind depend on the ground of necessity and can be applied only when it would be a clear violation of the sense of the author to refer to the immediate antecedent. So he's saying that it's it makes sense that it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the true God um, that we shouldn't believe the contention um, yeah, so it refers, Jesus Christ is the true God. That's how we should interpret it. Another point he makes is this construction seems to be demanded by the ad adjunct 
which John has assigned to the phrase, the true God, eternal life. This is an expression which John would be likely to apply to the Lord Jesus, considered as life and the source of life, and not to God as such. How familiar is this language with John as applied to Christ? So he quotes, In him was life, and the life was the light of people, giving life to the world, the bread of life. My words are spirit in life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This life or Christ was manifested and we have seen it and do testify to you and declare the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Um, and then he quotes, let's see, First John 1, 2. Yeah, this is what, he, what we just read. And yeah, there is... There is no instance in the writings of John in which the appellation life and eternal life is bestowed upon the Father to de designate him as the author of spiritual and eternal life. And as, as this occurs so frequently in John's writing as applied to Christ, the laws of exegesis require that both the phrase, the true God, and eternal life should be applied to him. Uh, next, it refers to God as such or the word true. Tan eli, eli thinon, or theon, it would be mere tautology or a mere truism. The rendering would then be that we may know the true God and we are in the true God. This is the true God in eternal life. Can we believe that an inspired man would affirm gravely and with so much solemn, solemnity and as if it were a, a truth of so much magnitude that the true God is the true God? <laughs> Oh, we're getting in very, uh, very wordy. I think um, I think we're going to go to the last part of this. I think we're just going to we're we're taking it as this is referring to Jesus Christ as the true God. It makes the most sense just how the grammar is set up. And. He also says at the end, and eternal life. So he has life in himself, and we're just going to visit a lot of these verses here. John 5, 26, Jesus says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. John 5, 40, And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. So Jesus is the source of life. And John is emphasizing this. Notice how we're in the, the Gospel of John. John 10.10 10, The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 6.33 For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Speaking of himself. I am, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. John 6, 48, I am that bread of life. John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of this world. Verse 53, Vera, truly, truly, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. 63. It is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 11.25 I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. John 20, 31, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. 1 John 1, 1 and 2, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. 
And then lastly, 1 John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So is there any question that Jesus is our source of eternal life? How can you not? John just emphasizes it over and over that we might believe that Jesus, uh, his Son, Jesus Christ, this is Jesus is the true God, and he is life. He is the source of life. And if you have him, you have life. If you are in him, you have life. If you abide in him, you have life. Friend, give your heart to him today. He's your only source of life. And I'm sure if you've stayed with me this far, you are highly considering it. All right. And we have one more verse. And we're on verse 21. The final verse of 1 John 5. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And yeah, we're going to we're going to go through this. All right, so this little children, this is an expression that John has used. It's the favorite mode of address with John. We saw it in 1 John 2:1. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. You know, John the aged, he was in his late 90s, probably probably near 100 at this point. And he was the last surviving uh, apostle of the original 12. And um, here he is writing to those underneath him. So he is the oldest in the faith and the uh, one of the w eyewitnesses to Jesus' life. So he's a John the Aged. And it was proper to use it in giving his parting counsel, embracing, in fact, all that he had to say that they should keep themselves from idols and suffer or not permit anything to alienate their affections from the true God. His great object had been to lead them to the knowledge and love of God, and all his counsels would be practically followed. Practically followed. If, amidst the temptations of idolatry and the allurements of sin, nothing were allowed to estrange their hearts from him. All right, and then he says, keep, you know, he's saying, keep yourselves from idols or from worshiping them, from all that would imply communion with them or their devotees. And we can see this thought brought out through the scriptures where in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. The word rendered idols here is idol, idol, idolon. In Greek, means properly an image, a specter, a shade, as of the dead, than any image or figure which would represent anything, particularly anything invisible, and hence anything to de design to represent God, and that was set up with a view to be acknowledged as representing him, or to bring him or his perfections more vividly before the mind. The word is applicable to idol gods, pagan deities. And there's some references here. 1 Corinthians 8, 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. 1 Corinthians 8, 7. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. 1 Corinthians 10.19 What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? R Romans 2.22 Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacrilege? 2 Corinthians 6.16 and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then 1 Thessalonians 1.9 For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn to God from idols to serve the true, the living and true God. All right, so... That's what he's meaning here. These idols that many, uh, you know, many people have been rescued from to tr to serve the living and true God, 
these images of false gods. We're not to uh, have any image. We're not to bow down to other gods, which are really devils and demons. And they're not to be adored. I would say today more of the idols in our culture are perhaps sports figures, perhaps musicians, perhaps actresses, or lifestyles, or um, leisure lifestyles. You know, there are many uh, idols that people put their devotion to in this country specifically that uh, would be considered idolatry. Covetousness, we know, is considered idolatry. All right, so it's an image or representation of the deity. That's specifically what an idol is. And the making of that an object of adoration instead of the true God. So whatever we adore in place of the true God, this is what John is warning us. Since one of these things would be likely to lead to the other, both are forbidden in the prohibitions of idolatry. You know, we know in the Ten Commandments, we have Exodus 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven, Im graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So this would forbid all attempts to represent God by paintings or statutory or all idol worship, meaning statues, you know, pointing to the Roman Catholic Church. All idol worship or worship of pagan gods, all images and pictures that would be substituted in the place of God as objects of devotion or that might transfer the homage from God to the, to the image. And all giving of these affections to other beings or objects which are due to God. Why the Apostle closed this epistle with this injunction, he has not stated, and it may not be easy to determine. It may have been for such reasons as these. Number one, those to whom he wrote were surrounded by idolaters, and there was danger that they might fall into prevailing sin or in some way so act as to be understood to lend their sanction to idolatry. Or secondly, in a world full of alluring objects, there was danger then. And there is at all times that the affections should be fixed on other objects than the supreme God and that what is due to him should be withheld. He says it may be added in the conclusion of the exposition of this epistle that the same caution is as needful for us as it was for those to whom John wrote. We are not in danger indeed of bowing down to idols or, by, or of engaging in the grosser forms of idol worship. But we may be in no less danger than they to whom John wrote were of substituting other things in our affections in the place of the true God and of devoting to them the time and the affection which are due to him only. Our children, it is possible to love with such an attachment as shall effectually exclude the true God from the heart. So he's saying your children can be idols. The world its wealth and pleasures and honors we may love with a degree of attachment such as even an idolater would hardly show to his idol gods and all the time which he would take in performing his devotions in an idol temple we may devote with equal fervor to the service of the world you know how many people like i said how many people make their job their idol or the pursuit of wealth an idol you know we they pursue all these these things that take the place of God, they take their devotion, they put it into the things of this world. There is practical idolatry all over the world in nominally Christian lands as well as among the pagan, in families that acknowledge no God but wealth and fashion, in the hearts of multitudes of individuals who would scorn the thought of worshiping at a pagan altar, and it is even to be found in the heart of many of many a one who profess to be acquainted with the true God and to be an heir of heaven. God should have the supreme place in our affections. The love of everything else should be held in strict subordination to the love of him. He alone should reign in our hearts, be acknowledged in our closets, our prayer closets, our families, and in the place of public worship. Be submitted to all at all times as having a right to command and control us. 
be obeyed in all the expressions of his will, by his word, by his providence, and by his spirit. Be so loved that we shall be willing to part without a complaint with the dearest object of affection when it takes it from when he takes it from us, and so that with joy and triumph we shall welcome his messenger, the angel of death, when he shall come to summon us into his presence. To all who may read these illustrations of the epistle of the beloved disciple, may God grant this inestimable blessing and honor. Amen. Wow, what a conclusion. So Jesus is to be our supreme love. And that was the, the warning in the church of Ephesus. There, they had left their first, first love and their chief love. And so John is admonishing all the believers that we should, we should pursue Jesus. We should abide in him and we should trust him as God and as Savior. He came in human flesh. He came to be a sacrifice for our sin. And we there is an abiding in him that John knew, that John was sharing. And there are things that will take away that abiding. And that's through idolatry. Perhaps that's why he stated this at the end. Idolatry will turn your affections onto things of this world. False gods, perhaps, false affections, things that can be taken away. Things that won't make you ready for heaven. You have to examine your life. Make sure we get rid of those things which would take away from our, our, our chief love, our number one love, which is God. And that we trust in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as God, the truth, the light of the world and that we what might stay close to him i think that um, is the conclusion of this letter so thank you friends for staying with me through this bible study it's been an awesome uh an awesome study through first john in many of the things that he has talked about that we can trust in jesus christ as our savior if we will make him our king if we will obey him with our whole heart, if we will flee from sin and walk in holiness and pursue him in holiness and purify ourselves even as he is pure because he came to destroy the works of the devil in our lives. He came to set us free from sin and he came to that we might abide in him and that we may know him. I hope this is your mission in life, friend, and I hope you can see that this letter points us in that direction to flee many of the lies that were that are are shed, said about Jesus many of the false religions that teach a false Jesus and John is I think set many things in order of what the true Jesus who the true Jesus is he is God we can trust him we should devote our whole life to him so may that be that's my prayer for your life friend may it be your mission in life to pursue God with your whole heart mind soul and strength and love him um, that should be your main mission in life so thank you for tuning in and i'm going to i'm seeking the lord on the next uh, book and bible study that i will be doing right now matthew is at the head of the list and i hope you will be looking for those videos in the near future as we pursue down one of the gospels a historical narrative on the life of jesus so God bless you, and I hope you will tune in to the next study. We'll see you then.